across the fence, we celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Cedar Creek. We'll walk the battlefields and cross the rivers and roads where Vermonters fought and died in a comeback victory over Confederate forces. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. One of the treasures of the Vermont State House is the painting of the Battle of Cedar Creek by Julian Scott. Scott's massive painting is 20 feet wide and 10 feet tall, and that doesn't include the frame. What's perhaps even more impressive is that it doesn't glorify the war. Instead, Scott chose to show the pain, suffering, and human cost associated with war. Estimates put the casualties at Cedar Creek around 8,000. Across the Fence associate producer Keith Silva and Civil War historian Howard Coffin begin our program in the mountains overlooking the Shenandoah Valley. The Civil War historian Bruce Catton once wrote, there may be a lovelier country somewhere in the island Vale of Avalon at a gamble, but when the sunlight lies upon it and the wind puts white clouds racing their shadows, the Shenandoah Valley is as good as anything America can show. The Shenandoah Valley was fought over through most of the Civil War. One city, Winchester, changed hands more than 70 times. And 12 miles south of Winchester, a stream called Cedar Creek bubbles into the North Fork of the Shenandoah River. Sheridan strikes first at Winchester on the morning of the 19th of September. He forms his army in a three mile long battle line and advances and Jubal Early's forces turn him back. The day goes on and not much progress for the Union Army. And then out in this area, north of a plantation house called Hackwood, the 8th Vermont goes into business. Stephen Thomas, its commander, is sick of a lack of progress. Under fire, he rides out in front of his men, turns and looks back and says, boys, if you ever pray, pray now. Remember old Vermont and we'll drive them to hell. Come on, old Vermont. And now the 8th Vermont is moving and now the whole corps is moving, and now the whole battle line is moving, and now the cavalry comes down from the north, and the Battle of Winchester becomes a massive Union victory, and Sheridan is able to report that the rebel army went whirling through Winchester. Three days after the victory at Winchester, Sheridan again defeated Early with a brilliant flanking maneuver at Fisher's Hill. Then he took his army and marched 50 miles up the valley, moving south to Harrisonburg, turned and came back along the valley, burning farms, burning crops, and burning mills. One of the mills that Sheridan burned, you can see in the trees along the banks of Cedar Creek. Today in the Shenandoah Valley, they still call it the burning. By the middle of October 1864, Phil Sheridan had defeated Jubal Early's army three times at Winchester, at Fisher's Hill, and then in a cavalry fight at Tom's Brook. Then Sheridan had marched 50 miles up and down the valley, and finally he brought his army to rest on the high fields around the plantation house of Bell Grove. His 35,000 man army covered these fields. He had them dig in. And he was so satisfied that he had defeated Early's army that he went north to Washington to meet with his superiors and left Major General Horatio Wright in charge. Despite his losses, there was still a lot of fight left in Jubal Early and his army and they were closer than Sheridan suspected. General Jubal Early needed a plan of attack. 
So he sent Jedediah Hotchkiss, Stonewall Jackson's old map maker, to the top of the Massanutten Mountain, which rises 1,500 feet above Cedar Creek. And from there, Hotchkiss said that he could see the insignias on the Union officer's shoulders. Hotchkiss reported that the federal lines did not extend all the way to the river, leaving a vulnerable flank open to attack. Along this stretch of the Shenandoah River, 7,000 Confederate infantrymen in the pre-dawn hours of October 19th crossed this river, overpowering mounted Union sentries in the middle of the river. Early attacks before sunrise, and the Battle of Cedar Creek begins. Vermonter Stephen Thomas's little brigade that included the 8th Vermont Regiment was encamped in this field in front of Bell Grove when the battle began. Immediately they are given the order to cross the Valley Pike and go to the high ground and try to slow the Confederate onslaught. In the foggy first light, Thomas's brigade came up this little hill to take position on the summit. They could hear the rebel yells coming in as thousands of Confederates advanced upon them. Where these cows graze today, the 8th Vermont made it stand, a regiment on either side of it. Herbert Hill was a member of the 8th Vermont who fought here and he wrote, bleeding, stunned, and being literally cut to pieces, but refusing to surrender colors or men, falling back only to prevent being completely encircled, the noble regiment had accomplished its mission. When General William Emery ordered the Vermonters to take position on this hill, he never expected to see them again. Years later, he told Stephen Thomas, I knew I was sending you into the jaws of death. 21 years after the battle, members of the 8th Vermont gathered to dedicate this monument to themselves here on the battlefield. All of this land now, including this monument, is part of a national park, thanks to the late United States Senator James Merrill Jeffords. Despite the 8th Vermont's brave stand and other fragmented resistance, the Confederate surprise attack, which swept across the Shenandoah River and Cedar Creek, by 7.30 in the morning had the entire Union Army in retreat. The attack engulfed all these fields and the Bell Grove House, which is still pockmarked by bullets. It was a stunning early Confederate victory under Jubal Early. Driven about three miles north by the surprise attack, Sheridan's army retreated until George Getty's division of the Sixth Corps reached this ridge top, this curving ridge top, and decided here to make a stand this day under the command of Vermonter Lewis Addison Grant. The Vermont Brigade, the old brigade, was here in the middle. On the right was James Meach Warner's brigade, he from Middlebury, Vermont. And to the left was another brigade that included a New York regiment that was right up against the Vermonters. The Confederates came on and made a first attack and the 4,000 Union soldiers on this ridge drove them back. Now Jubal Early brought up cannon and shelled this ridge. Second in command of the New Yorkers, Lieutenant Colonel Windsor French, jumped in front of his men and proceeded to give one of the clever commands of the entire Civil War. Hollering his words so the Vermonters and New Yorkers could hear it, he shouted, men, don't run till the Vermonters do. Well, the New York 
resistance stiffened as they remembered the old rivalries with Vermont. Vermont held firm and that third attack was thrown back down the hill and Jubal Early's victory at Cedar Creek had ended. General Sheridan, returning from his meetings in Washington, reached Winchester, Virginia the night of October 18th. He decided to spend the night in this big comfortable house. The next morning, he awakened, had breakfast, and began to hear distant gunfire from the direction of his army a dozen miles to the south at Cedar Creek. He cut short the breakfast and began to ride south. Sheridan mounts his big black Morgan Rienzi and he starts south on the Valley Pike, now busy Route 11 here in Virginia. He soon begins to meet stragglers from his army, defeated soldiers moving north and he rides into their midst and hollers at them. God damn you, turn around, follow me. We're going back to the battlefield. And he turns them around and soon he has a small army headed for the conflict at Cedar Creek. As the thunder of the guns grows louder and louder, he pounds south. About 10.30 in the morning, Phil Sheridan completed his ride from Winchester and came riding along the line of his soldiers and the first troops he sees is the Vermont Brigade. He asks who they are, he's told the Vermonters and he said, we'll have our camps back by nightfall. It took Sheridan until three o'clock in the afternoon to get his troops realigned to form an attack line and then at three o'clock he gave the order to go forward. Incidentally, at about that moment, 500 miles to the north, Confederates were robbing the banks in St. Albans. Sheridan's counterattack swept forward about a mile, and then the Confederates dug in and stopped it. They were fighting well until suddenly they began to feel the ground beneath their feet quaking. They thought it might have been an earthquake. No. It was 4,000 horses riding down from the northwest, Custer's cavalry, including the Vermont cavalry, and Cedar Creek turned into a rout, a mighty Union victory. Out behind the Belgrove Plantation House, out beside the pasture, is a cemetery. Here are buried the slaves that worked the Belgrove Plantation. Their graves are marked only by rough field stones, no names, no dates. The Civil War was fought about slavery. Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves in the Confederate States. His reelection was to be contested less than three weeks after the Battle of Cedar Creek, and the Vermont Brigade and the rest of the army camped around Belgrove voted here for president. Terrell Harriman, a soldier from St. Johnsbury, wrote home, on the 4th of November came the national election, the contest being between Lincoln and McClellan. Soldiers of age in the field were entitled to vote. The army roll said that I was 21 years old, so I cast my vote for Abraham Lincoln when I was 18. The ballot box was placed on a stump in our camp. Nearby, the pools of blood was scarcely dry. <laughs> 